Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. And you know, it was uh, three years ago, and then it was uh, last year. We ended up talking with legendary investor Jim Rogers, and it turns out Everything that he told us about back then made sense, and it came true. When we were talking with him last time, I was a little bit credulous, but he said that he was bullish on Japanese equities precisely because they were debasing their currency. That turned out to be the correct view, of course, and so now we're going to get to talk with him again. Jim, welcome to the show. I'm delighted to be here, Chris. Good evening. Good morning. Good evening. Good morning. You're in Singapore. Uh, I'm over here in the United States and uh, about a half a world apart. Morning here and evening there. Go ahead. Absolutely. So uh, here's what I want to get your views on. Um, the Federal Reserve is uh, at the end of its QE program. It looks like the U.S. markets are topping out. There's a lot of uncertainty in the markets. But let's start with Japan. You were right to call uh, a bullish call on Japanese equities then. Where do you stand now? Well, I'm still along Japan. I uh, would like to buy more if I find the right opportunity and the right thing. Um, I suspect well, conceivably, Japan is going to turn into a bubble again. You know, it's been 25 years since they had a bubble in Japan, so maybe they're overdue. And Mr. Abe, the prime minister and the head of the central bank, seem determined to do whatever it takes to drive things higher. They said they'll print, their words, unlimited amounts of money. So I'm afraid it could turn into a bubble. In any case, I'm still buying well, now, Japan's an interesting case, obviously. They're, they're losing population at this point, and what remains is rapidly aging. Does it make sense to try and pump things up, given the demographics? Well, Chris, I can. Japan is going to be a disaster. Mr. Abe is going to go down in history as the person who ruined Japan. Uh, in, in you know 20 years from now, people are going to look back and say, oh, gosh, well, that was it. That was the end. But, uh, and for everything you just got through saying, I mean, the population is declining. The debt is going through the roof. The currency is being destroyed. None of these things are good to build an economy or to build a long-term future. But it's good for stockbrokers and it's good for investors because it does make stocks go up, whether we like it or not. And history will, will say Mr. Abe ruined Japan, but in the meantime, he uh, is getting stocks higher and higher. Now, how do you feel about United States equities given that same uh, dynamic? Do you think the Federal Reserve is committed to do whatever it takes? Well, what I suspect will happen with the U.S. is that the U.S. will have some kind of correction somewhere along the line for whatever reason, and then everybody will call up after, I don't know, when the market goes down 9% or 13%, you, you make up the number, everybody will call up Washington and say, oh my gosh, you've got to save, you've got to save us. Civilization is at risk. You're going to ruin, mm -hmm. to ruin your reputation in, in our lives, in our world. You know, those people in Washington are bureaucrats and politicians. They're not terribly smart. And so they'll panic. They'll give up and they'll come to the rescue. I don't know what they'll do. They'll do something to calm everybody down. And then I suspect the market will turn around and have another big rally. It, too, may go on to new highs. It could even turn into a bubble, depending on how, how panicked the people in Washington get. Uh, and then that will be the end. You know, the market will make its final top. Uh, that, that could take weeks or months, but then the market will make its final top, and that will be the end, and we will start having serious stock market problems worldwide. And when you say, what's your time frame for those serious stock market problems worldwide? Is this uh, something that will take a year or two to resolve, or is this something that might last the rest of my life? What, what are you talking about here? Not, uh, well, the rest of your life would be wonderful. You're, you're a young man, so it would be terrific. Uh, even the rest of my life would be terrific. No, no, I suspect in the next year or two, we will see some kind of major, major problems, longer-term problems in the world financial markets. I would suspect that this, as I said, when we have this correction, it's going to cause the central banks to panic. That would happen in the next few weeks or months. And then um, and then we have the, the them galloping to the rescue to save us all. We go, that turns into a, a rally, a big rally. It could last a few weeks, a few months. So certainly by 2016, I'm sure we're all going to be moaning and groaning because there's going to come a time when there's not much the central banks can do, when they will have lost all credibility, when governments have lost all credibility, 
they will print and spend and borrow, but there comes a time when people are just going to say, we don't want to play this game anymore. And at that point, that's when the world has a serious, serious problem because there's nothing to rescue us. Now, do you ever speculate about what those next things might be? Uh, I've heard lots of speculation, potentially a debt jubilee, maybe a tax rebate. I'm mean, giving money to Main Street instead of Wall Street. Would if if you could war game that out and knew what they were going to do, would that change your investment strategies? Uh, well, of course, if I knew what they were going to do, I would I would invest accordingly. Uh, one of the things they will probably do, if if it comes to it, is they will take money away from bank deposits. You know, they've already mm-hmm. passed the, the regulations. We said we can take money away from depositors now. They couldn't do that before. The last time around, they did it in Cyprus. They did it in a few places. But in America, it was not legal in the U.K., but it is now legal that they can take your money out of your bank account if they want to, if they decide to. But I know who knows what they may do. They may buy stocks. You know, some countries, the central banks have been buying stocks. They could do all sorts of things. They, Mr. Bernanke once said that, he, he would have the power to do anything he wanted. He could buy gold mining, gold mines if he wanted to. He could do whatever he wanted. So who knows what they'll do. They'll get more and more desperate, but the more desperate they get, the more the world, other than rallies, the world's going to realize, hey, my gosh, this game is up. Now, by the way, Chris, we may conceivably survive one more big uh, financial problem, big problem, serious problem, a collapse, if you will. But if we do, if they come up with something to save us the next time around, the time after that, boy, that's, there's nothing they can do then. I suspect that the next uh, economic collapse, financial collapse, will be the one that they cannot deal with. But if somehow they're miracle workers, be very, very careful and worried about 2022, 2023, because then the game will definitely be up if it's not up this time around. And why do you hold that view? Is it because of all the debt outstanding, or do you have resources in that view as well? Or what, what's really underpinning that view that we've got one, maybe two cycles left, but, but then we're in trouble? Well, as you know, we, we had a problem in 2008, which was the worst we've had in a long time, but much worse than the earlier financial crisis, and that was because the debt was so, so much higher. Well, Chris, look out the window. The debt is everywhere now. I mean, it's staggering. Uh, there's no country in the world that has lower debt today than it had in 2008. Uh, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet alone is, has quintupled, more than quintupled, just in those few years. So no, things are getting much, much worse. All the countries we've talked about uh, austerity, they all have higher debt now than they did last year. They will all have higher debt next year than they had last year or this year. No, this is, this is all a, a shell game. It's a sham. And the debt keeps going higher and higher and higher. Well, you mentioned uh, the the bank deposits being now seizable in in the chain of uh, of dissolution and and uh, bail-ins and all of that. I've been a little surprised that gold hasn't been slightly more popular. Given that, I, I think people have turned to long dated government bonds as a means of hopefully protecting their wealth. Uh, how, how do you see gold playing out in this particular story? Well, I own gold. I own some gold, and I I never sold any gold. I have had gold for many years. Uh, but I have not bought gold in, in quite some time. You know, gold has been an anomaly. Gold went up 12 years in a row, as you well know, without, without a down year. Now, that's very strange. That does not happen in markets. So the correction that gold is now going through is also an anomaly, if you ask me, because we have to correct that, that huge move up of 12 years in a row. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to last. I'm not buying gold. At this stage, I even had some of my gold, not much, but some, because uh, I expect another chance to buy gold sometime in the next year or two. Uh, if it happens, if it happens, I hope I'm smart enough to step in and buy a lot of gold. Mm-hmm. And what are you seeing over there in, in Singapore around gold buying? I know I've read lots of stories, haven't been there myself, about China uh, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange uh, You know, over there in Asia. Obviously, a love affair going on with gold. I've been surprised seeing how much gold has been going from west to east, uh, that the price has been doing what it's been doing, but those are markets. So what, are you seeing? Are you noticing any uh, increased attention to gold in Singapore or about the same? Well, there is more interest in gold. You know, in China, it was almost impossible to buy gold 15 years ago, even 10 years ago. Now there are gold shops everywhere uh, in China. It's easy to buy, and they have been buying, and that is pretty much true of other places 
in Asia as well. Uh, there was, when gold first collapsed, there was a big move. A lot of people rushed to buy, but that cooled off. I was just in China. In fact, I, I saw a gold shop, so I stopped to go in to see what was happening. There was not a soul in the shop except five five staff members. I was very excited to see anybody. Uh, I even bought a few coins just to keep them happy. Uh, I bought three silver coins, I think, and one gold. Uh, it seemed to be the highlight of their day. So it certainly calmed down in, in Asia. The gold buying, uh, and I, as I said, I suspect there's going to be another chance for all of us to buy gold. I don't know why. You know, Chris, gold has not had a 50% correction in many, many years. That's unusual because most things have 50% corrections every three or four or five years. It's just the way the markets work. But gold has not. So back to my point, the anomaly is how gold has been acting for the last several many years. There's still too many holy people who think that gold is mystical, mm -hmm. that gold can never go down. Uh, we've got to wait for some of them to give up. We've got to wait for some of them to just throw gold out the window and say, she was dishonest. She lied to me. I'll never touch gold again in my life. Then we can have a bottom, and then maybe uh, it'll be time to buy a lot. Well, let's let's turn to one of my other favorite commodities that, that was dishonest and lied, which was oil uh, coming down from a high of, uh, you know, in the 110 zone and, and getting halved on the world market. Uh, what are you making of the oil markets here? Well, you, you're right. It was dishonest. What happened, is, as you know, America was negotiating with Iran last summer, and then the deadline came of July, July 31st, uh, and they, all, they both agreed to extend the deadline for a year. Well, you can look at your charts, and you'll see that's when oil started going down because America told Saudi Arabia to dump oil, to get the Iranians under control and the Russians. Saudi Arabia was very happy to do that because they need to do something about fracking. They cannot stop fracking, but they can bring a ration, rationale a sense to the fracking market. So they started dumping. Uh, you, you, you see the charts as well as I do. It looks to me like oil will probably be making a bottom sometime this year, no matter what Saudi Arabia does at this point. Uh, and I would not sell oil. As you know, Chris, the way markets work, usually when something has a big collapse, there's a dead cat bounce, there's a big bounce for whatever reason, and then a few weeks or months later, the market tests the lows. So I would suspect that there will be a test of the low sometime in the next few weeks or months, but that the lows will hold and that oil will then go its merry way again. The fundamentals of oil are such that the world has continued to use more oil than it has discovered. Uh, I mean, yeah, yes, we're not discovering as much as we're using anywhere in the world except for fracking, and therefore world reserves except for fracking continue to decline. So the world oil problem is not, is not pretty if you go out a year or two or a few years. Yeah, that was something that caught my attention even February in 2014, full year and three months ago, when all the international oil majors were cutting their capital expenditures because they couldn't both profitably search for oil and pay dividends. So they cut CapEx in that story, and that was with oil at 110. My concern is a couple, two, three years out, I, I think that that shortage of CapEx will, will translate into shortage of production. And oil is right now below its marginal cost of production. That seems like a pretty good place to to think about getting in for any commodity, doesn't it? Well, normally, but I, I've been around a long time, and I've seen plenty of commodities stay below the cost of production for longer than anybody would think is, is mm. sensible or rational. Uh, everything you said is correct, uh, and we will, it will cause problems eventually, whether the problems are this year or whatever. I do know they'll be this decade, if not this year, because everybody has cut back, and as I said, even before the cutback, the world was using more oil than it was finding every year. And so world reserves continue to go into decline, except for fracking. And fracking, of course, we now know the wells are very short-lived wells. These wells these wells are dry up pretty quickly. So fracking is not as wonderful as we thought. Most of the frackers had negative cash flow. They only survived by rushing around, drilling, drilling, drilling more wells, which is why production is still going up. But that will change very soon. I agree. I agree. The, the negative cash flows, it was like they were making it down on volume. It was a strange 
a strange situation. So, Jim, as we turn our attention to Europe, obviously, uh, I'm almost uh, tired of analyzing what Greece may or may not do. It's a rumor a day. But do you have a point of view on, on where Greece is headed and how this might turn out? Well, first I'll tell you what should have, what would be best for Greece and for the world. What would be best would be if Greece went ahead and went bankrupt and defaulted on its loans because they can never pay them off, no matter how much phony bookkeeping or sleight of hand you want to use. So it's impossible. They should just go ahead and go bankrupt. I would not leave the euro if I were Greece. That would make it even worse for Greece. They should go bankrupt, stay in the euro, and default on their loans. Now, they may get thrown out if they default on their loans. Because, you know, many American states have gone bankrupt in our history. They didn't get thrown out of the U.S. Many counties, many cities. It's not the end of the world. You don't have to leave just because you go bankrupt. Uh, that would be the best solution. Will that happen? Probably not. I'm sure something is going to come along to make everybody say things are okay. You know, one, one uh, situation is the, the Greeks are Greek Orthodox, and the Orthodox Church, the center of the Orthodox Church is in Greece. Uh, the Russians are also Orthodox, and who knows? Uh, Putin is doing all sorts of things with the church these days, so for all I know, Putin is going to rise to the ride to the rescue of the Greeks. It'll make him look good. It'll poke, uh, it'll poke the, uh, the Americans and the Europeans in the eye. Who knows what come, may come out, but I suspect something will come up which will make everybody say things are okay, even though they're not. And if if uh, Greece does default, um, as far as I understand, nearly all of the debt is, has been sequestered in the ECB, so it's just an explosion on a central bank balance sheet, which is not really a, a, a market-moving event, is it? Well, yes, it'll move the market, I assure you, at least for an hour, if not for a week. Uh, it will have some effect because many people will panic. Somebody's going to lose, no matter what happens. But uh, Greece is a very, very small economy uh, in the world context, very small in Europe, very small even in the Euro context, tiny. But it will make headlines and it will cause some dislocations in the market for a while. Now, you brought up Russia, and I've been intrigued by watching, uh, you know, Russia going under sanctions and things going quiet a little bit. Um, do you have a sense, is, is uh, Russia going to be brought back into the fold, or do you think this, this uh, coldness is going to persist for a while? Well, uh, I'm buying Russia. I'm, I'm bullish on Russia uh, at this point. Will it be brought back into the fold? Not at the moment. There, you know, there are some bureaucrats in Washington. You know, they caught the lady on, on the telephone plotting for the illegal coup in, in Russia or in Ukraine. So she and her friends obviously have a, an ax to grind to make sure that Russia is still a bad, a bad guy. Uh, so I don't think you're going to see anything solved uh, anytime soon with the U.S. and with the West. Uh, it, it's, bad for, it's bad for the U.S. It's bad for the West. Many Western companies, European companies, are already suffering because of the sanctions certainly suffering as much as the Russians, if not more. But worse still, Chris, is we're now driving the Russians and the Asians together and the Iranians and everybody else. And yes, it's a temporary blow to Russia, but unfortunately in the long term, it's going to make Russia stronger because they're going to be even tighter with the, the Chinese, the Iranians, and many other Asian countries, which cannot be good for the U.S. Well, I agree, and it was an amazing pivot that Russia did uh, after being annexed and, and pushed away by the U.S. US trying to isolate it, seeing the gas deals that Russia struck with China, extraordinary, $400 billion, 38 billion cubic meters, uh, just an astonishing uh, set of figures on that, and then they struck a second deal. And now we've got China uh, looking to lay claim to what we hope are, they hope are uh, hydrocarbon resources in the South China Sea with the Spratly Island deal. Uh, the United States there poking at, at China on this, China seeming to be pretty firm about this. Um, do you think China's going to uh, uh, stick to its guns and, and lay claim to those islands, or is there room for negotiation here? Well, lay claim. I, Chris, if you go back and look at old maps, you know, Rand McNally is the quintessential American company. Rand McNally net maps from like 1947 show the Spratly Islands as part of China. Uh, we're a little bit doing a little uh, revisionist history here hmm. all of a sudden uh, in, the, in the U.S. Get out some old maps, old American maps, not old Chinese <laughs> maps, old American maps. And you'll see that the Spratlys were always considered part of China. 
uh, why America's doing all this, I have no clue other than the fact that maybe we think we should control the world and everybody should jump up. We've got a lot of bureaucrats in Washington who need something to do, need to make themselves important. Uh, I know China's not going to give in. You know, they've, they've been around a few thousand years and they are firmly convinced, partly because of American maps, that the Spadleys are theirs. Now, I would hate to see us all go to war and do something foolish over a few rocks in the middle of the ocean, whether it's with the Koreans and the Japanese and the, or the Chinese. They're all fighting over some rocks in the water. Uh, it, it's a shame we can't, somebody can't sit down and sort of divide it up and say, guys, there's no sense spending billions of dollars on tanks and planes and killing thousands of millions of people. Let's sort this out. You may remember that 500 years ago, when the, there was a big dispute in the, in the Western Hemisphere about whether the Spanish or the Portuguese should own it. They were about to go to war, and they went to the Pope, and the Pope divided it up. I, I wish we could find somebody who was as well thought of as the Pope in 2016 or 17 who could sort this out. Because I know the Chinese are not going to give up. I know the Americans keep trying to throw their weight around. And, and I don't know what business it is of, of the U.S., but somebody in Washington thinks it is. Well, yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that. So, um, Jim, in a, as a final question here then, um, you know, I have a lot of people, myself included, pretty confused by how to invest in this environment because, uh, frankly, from my point of view, it seems more like speculators, uh, you know, environment than an investor's environment. People throwing TA out the window, wondering when fundamentals will matter again. H how do you go about in investing in an environment like this? Uh, well, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, this seems to be a market where momentum is what everybody is playing. Uh, I, I've seen a little bit in the past, not as extensively as it is now, but you're right. But the only thing that seems to matter now is momentum for people. But you're starting to see that go the other way. Germany is already rolled over. America's not doing very well. I don't know how people should invest. I, what I'm doing is I continue to buy, to buy China. China looks like an incipient bubble, which would be a shame because in it, if it turns into a bubble, I will have to sell my Chinese shares. <clears throat> I continue to invest in Russia, although not at the moment because oil is, I suspect, going to be trying testing its bottom. Japan, I'm still involved in. Um, what else am I doing? I own U.S. dollars. My U.S. dollar is my largest position, not because I have any confidence in the U.S. dollar. It's a terribly, terribly, terribly flawed currency with the largest debtor nation in world history and the debt is going higher and higher and higher. Uh, but there's a, going to be more turmoil coming, Chris, and during periods of turmoil, people flee to a safe haven. The U.S. dollar is not a safe haven, but many people think it is, and, and they don't know what else to do, so they will go to the U.S. dollar. They're not going to the yen. They're not going to the euro. So we may even turn into a bubble in the U.S. I could conceivably see, and this is a scenario that might work out, the U.S. dollar, for a variety of reasons, turns into a bubble. That, of course, is not good for gold. Gold drops a lot, at which point I would have to sell my U.S. dollars and hopefully be smart enough to buy gold, if, if it works that way. Uh, <laughs> in the meantime, the Chinese market could be turning into a bubble. It looks like it might. I'd have to sell my Chinese shares. Uh, I don't know what I would do with the money at that point. Because if that happens, the Japanese market will be a lot higher. I don't want to buy it that much higher. I'd have to sell it somewhere along the line. So we're coming into some, we're always coming into interesting times. You say it's very difficult at this point. Chris, it's never been easy for me. All of my friends are always talking about, oh gosh, it used to be so easy. I don't remember it ever being. <laughs> maybe they, maybe their memory makes it easy, but it's always been hard for me making a living in the investment markets. But that's where I'm putting my money. In agriculture, of course, I'm, I'm optimistic about agriculture. Agriculture has done me dirt in the past a little while. But uh, I'm, I still love agriculture, even though she's been mean to me. <laughs> well, I, I do, too, for a bunch of, of long-dated reasons and, and looking where the world is going and where population's headed and where resources are going and how the weather's getting a little wonky, which is uh, going to make things interesting, I, I suspect, going forward. So it's always interesting. You're absolutely right, and I don't think it's ever been easy to put money in, pull it out. But what you've just described for me is sort of like bubble dodging, and and I am intrigued if the 
if the dollar is the final safe haven, but it turns into a roach motel and you gotta you gotta run out of that, where where do, what's on your list then? You said gold potentially, but I mean, where do you go if the U.S. bubble bursts? Well, if U.S. dollar bubble bursts, uh, and and the U.S. and the U.S. bubble bursts, well, that's what I'm. I don't know. Uh, by then, conceivably, China, the Chinese currency would be convertible. Uh, but but conceivably, the stock market in China would have turned into a bubble and it would burst. Uh, but the, if the currency becomes convertible, it looks like it may well in that period of time. I, I may have to sell my U.S. dollars, buy gold, buy them in Mindy. Uh, I don't know. Paper money everywhere in the world is suspect now. It's not a sound paper money anymore because politicians everywhere have learned to buy votes. Even dictators have learned to buy votes with their currency. So. It, it, it's, it's, it's not easy now, but for me, Chris, it's never been easy. Oh, well, with that, uh, I want to thank you so much for your time. We've been talking with uh, Jim Rogers, legendary investor, telling us that you've got to be nimble and, and watch the whole world and, and uh, be ready to move around the world with your money and maybe even your feet, uh, as some people have done. So, Jim, thank you so much for your time. I do appreciate it. Well, Chris, I also suggest they, they listen to you. Maybe that's how they'll figure out how to survive the coming crisis. And thrive. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>